Number 16, I want to preach this, this, this evening on joy in the midst of tribulation. Joy in the midst of tribulation. You know, the Bible says we're going to have tribulation in this world. The Bible says, that's what Jesus said. He says, but be of good cheer, for I have overcome the world already. We need to understand Amen. we're going to have tribulation. And some people, they may, they, this tribulation may be sickness. Some people, they, their tribulation may be, uh, this, you know, similar tribulation may be their personal tribulation. I believe, I personally believe that Christians are going to go through the tribulation. I believe we're gonna we're gonna go through the three and a half years of, of man's wrath, and we're gonna be spared from from God's wrath. I believe that's what happens with Christians. So uh, I believe that you can find that all through all through Matthew 24. I believe you can find it. But this is talking about in the time of our tribulation or a time of our testing or our troubles. And uh, we're gonna look at this here in Acts chapter number 16 and verse number 24 through 34. The Bible says that Paul and Silas here they're they're, they're going through the city. Um, they're going through the city here and uh, going through, um, I started verse number, looking on the verse number, yeah, keep on verse 24, I'll tell you the story. So basically Paul and Silas are going through um, Philippi and they're going through and there's a woman, there's a girl there who's possessed. Did you ever find that all, that anytime there's a, any problems, there was a demon possessed, no, I'm just kidding. But they're going through this problem is to find there's a, there's a demon possessed girl and they're giving a hard time and, and they're, they're, she's preaching the truth that these men were servants of God. But Paul and Silas didn't want to have a lot of commotion and, and trouble. They were trying to go to the temple to pray, and when they did, they lay, the magistrates lay hold on them, and they and they um, and they um, they're having a, they're having a problem with it. Paul turned and and did an exorcism, or you know, re, not exorcism. He called, he released the demon right then, right then and there, not exorcism. He cast the demons out of her right then and there. And verse number eighteen, and it says that the demon that came out the same hour, and then her masters saw that the hope of their gains was gone. They caught Paul and Silas and drew them into the marketplace into the rulers, and they brought them to the magistrates, saying, These men, being Jews, do exceedingly trouble our city. These people are, tr are troubling our cities. Verse number 21, And teach customs which are not lawful for us to receive, neither do observe, being Romans, which is the father thing from the truth. That wasn't what was going on. They were going to the temple to pray, and this woman was causing all sorts of problem, trouble, and... Peter and uh, Paul and Silas here cast a demon out of her, and then they got all upset about it. They got all upset about there because the financial gain was gone. That's pretty bad. Well, that goes along with this morning. They make merchandise of it. It's all about you know for personal gain. And then they start lying about him. And it says in verse 22, and the multitude rose up together against them, and the magistrates ran off their clothes and commanded to beat them. And when they had laid many stripes upon them, they cast them into prison, charging the jailer to keep them safely. By the way. Their charge was it was it was un, it was unscriptural. It's nowhere in scripture to say that, to beat them. Nowhere in any law does it say to do that except their own laws. They wanted it silenced and punished. They wanted this. They wanted the the, the teachings of Paul and Silas to stop. And it says in verse number twenty four, who having received such a charge, thrust them into the inner prison, and made their feet fast in the stocks. They, they locked them up. And at and at midnight. Paul and Silas prayed and sang praises unto God, and the prisoners heard them. And suddenly there was a great earthquake, so that the foundations of the prison were shaken. There was a jailhouse rock. And immediately all the doors were opened, and everyone's bands were loosed. And the keeper of the prison awake out of his sleep, and seeing the prison doors open, he drew out his sword and would have killed himself, supposing that the prisoners had been fled. But Paul cried with a loud voice, saying, Do thyself no harm, for we are all, we are all here. Then he called for a light, and sprang in, and came trembling. And fell down before Paul and Silas, and brought them out, and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? Verse 31, and they said, Repent of your sins. All right, all right. Verse 31, and they said, Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved in thy house. And they spake unto him the word of the Lord, and to all that were in his house. And he took them the same hour of the night, and washed their stripes, and was baptized, and he and all, and all his straightway. And when he had brought them out into his house, he set me before them and rejoiced, believing in God with all his house. So we're going to look at this passage here that talks about you know, how there's, there's joy in the midst of tribulation. You know, we have many believers today who have a misconstrued, a misconstrued notion of what joy is. Joy is not linked to happiness. I've heard it said that happiness is a, is a sign of being filled with the Spirit because, you know, happiness, you know, people, you know, 
you know, happiness is there. Happiness is not, is, happiness endures for a moment, but joy lasts for a lifetime. Joy lasts for a lifetime. Happiness is linked to fulfillment of expectation. Joy is hinged on the sovereignty and attributes of God in his very nature. Joy comes when we can depend on God, knowing who he is and what he will do. That gives us joy. Happiness comes on a, on a temporary thing. This morning, this afternoon, I was very happy. Dan and Charlene took us over to Jersey's, and I got some wings. And I'm telling you, I got some wings. I was happy. I was happy. It was temporary fulfillment. I was happy. It was linked to expectation. I expected those wings to be good, and they were. And that, that, was, that was happiness. But joy lasts forever. Um, jo um, go to Galatians chapter 5. I want to show you something here. Go joy is ob obviously it's a fruit of the Spirit. It's a, it's a proof or an evidence of the Spirit of God. I've heard it said by a preacher saying that when a person, that when, when a, you know that revival has happened when you can smile. And I'm like, that's crazy. The world smiles all the time. That's not, you know, people in the world smile all the time. That's not, smile, you know, if that's the case, then the Cheshire Cat was revived, amen? He was a, he was a revived Christian because he smiled all the time. Um, joy is not happy, you know, smiling is not a symbol of joy. It's just not. You know, you get mixed. People get all mixed up where, where they're going with it. And they, I, they, they got the idea where it says, Will thou not revive thy people? I think it's Psalms 84. It says, Will thou not revive thy people? But they, Will not thou not revive us again, that thy people may rejoice in thee? And he says, The sign that you've been revived is you can be able to smile. What kind of nonsense is that? Smiling does not mean you've been revived. I mean, sometimes people smile when they do crazy things and they're waiting for their wife to find out. You know, I do all kinds of stuff waiting for my wife to find out. Or you, you're fixing to pull a prank on someone, and you, you bait the hook, and you're waiting, you're waiting for them, or you're, you're, you're joking with someone. Like I do with Ed sometimes. And I get him going, I just look at someone and smile and laugh, because I got him wound up, and I waited for him to go, <laughs> like Ed usually does when he gets wound up. And it's fun. So I just can't help but sometimes smile about that. Laughter is not a sign of joy. It's not a sign of revival. Galatians chapter number 5, the Bible says in verse 22, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. If you look at that, love is joy. Joy is love. They all kind of, the words are, they're, they're separate, so they, they mean, they're, they're demonstrated separately, but that's the fruit of the Spirit. Love is the fruit of the Spirit. Joy is the fruit of the Spirit. And you can't have joy without love. You can't have love without joy. They all kind of connect. They are all kind of like, you can't have, well, my fruit of the Spirit is faith. No, no. Your fruit of the Spirit is going to be love, joy, peace, long suffering. It's going to manifest itself. The Spirit of God gives us different gifts. But the fruit of the Spirit is going to be manifested in all your life. Whether you recognize it or not, all of your life will have, if you're Spirit filled, all of your life will have all nine fruits bearing from it. Amen. You're not going to have, all oh, God has given me the gift of God. Well, it may be your gift of administration or the gift of the help of the church, but it's not the gift of the, it's not the fruit of the Spirit, amen? I remember I was talking to this one lady, and she goes, I believe that God has given me the gift of God. I'm like, maybe the gift of gossip. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> but, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, it's joy, it's peace. It comes from God. It comes as a de evidence of the, of the Spirit of God in our life. A soul that's been saved will have love. A soul that's been saved, that's been made alive, will have joy. A soul that's been saved will have peace. A soul that's been saved will have long suffering. A soul that's saved and revived will have gentleness and goodness and faith and meekness and temperance. All these things come from it. Paul and Silas, I'm going to give you some things about joy in the midst of tribulation. Paul and Silas had an understanding of God's nature. And they rested in knowing that God would work all things together for good. Go to Romans chapter number 8. Go to Romans chapter 8. Have people read this, misquote this verse, and we know all things work together for good. Well, yeah, it does, but let's read it in context. Let's read the whole verse and find out what the whole verse says instead of mincing verses here and there. It says in verse uh, Romans 8, 28, and we know that all things work together for that too. And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to his purpose. So we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to his purpose. When you have understanding of God's nature and you have understanding of God's of, of who God is, you know that all things are going to work together for good. This is why I believe, this is, this is one of the reasons I believe, knowing God's nature, I don't believe that God will put us through God's wrath. 
I don't believe a Christian to go through God's wrath because I know God's nature. The Bible says that he will not, he, we're not appointed unto wrath. Knowing that God is going to spare us from that, God is, I believe you, you can easily see from Scripture how God is going to be. Are we going to go through hardship? Are we going to go through a man's, through, you know, through a man's uh, wrath? Sure we are. We're going to go through tribulation. But Paul and Silas had an understanding that God's nature was that God was going to work all things together for good to them. You know, because they loved God and they were called according to the purpose. But they had an understanding of God's nature, and that brought them joy. Paul and Silas had exercised their understanding of God's nature. They exercised their understanding. A lot of people have faith in God. We talked to someone today, oh, I have faith, so much faith in God. I've got so, so much faith in God. They're going to a Catholic church, taking sacraments, trusting in the sacraments they get into heaven, not the shed blood of Jesus Christ, the death, burial, and resurrection. They're trusting in the sacraments. And they don't have faith in God. They have faith in what they do. And you can't, you know, you know how it is. You get the door, you got 30 seconds to get, to get the fish on the hook, and it's like, you, you didn't get it. It's just watch the fish go by, and it's kind of frustrating. But they, until a person exercises their faith, do you know what exercising faith means? It's believing. Amen. It's belief. Believe is a verb. Did you ever know that? Believing is a verb. Belief, belief is, is, you know, believing is what you put your faith in. It's what you put your faith in. It's exercised. Faith. A lot of people have faith, but it's not according to knowledge. They have zeal, but it's not according to knowledge. They have faith, but the Bible says, to, it doesn't say have faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. It says, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. You've got to put your faith, exercise your faith into the Lord Jesus Christ. And you have to exercise your understanding of God's nature. When you, you can sit back and say, I believe God's good, God's good, God's going to protect me. Great. Praise the Lord for that. But if you don't exercise your life, and if you don't exercise that fact then you don't believe it. You've got to be willing to yield yourselves vessels for God's use. Go to 1 Corinthians chapter number 12. Paul and Silas had to exercise themselves, so they exercised their understanding of God's nature. If I believe, it's like, it's like uh, my daughter, when she was younger, you know, like ever good father, you put her on the, something really high and dangerous. Really? Like a good father. You sit up on the high shelf, you jump. Well, of course, your mom's not around. Jump, jump, I'll catch you. And they kind of look at you, and they kind of look at you, and they're like, yeah, I don't think so. Oh, come on, Daddy will catch you. He close, and you get close, and they jump in your arms. And they're like, oh, that was fun. Do it again. You send them back up there, and then you back up a couple steps. And they like, eh. You walk back a couple steps, and they get used to jumping that short distance. And then you get them a little farther back. Well, you can do it in the pool with the guys. You can swim. I don't swim, like I told you before. But it's like you can get them on a height, you know, get them over there again, and have them jump again. And, boy, then they start getting a little daring, and then they Sooner or later, they're willing to jump great distances trusting you because they've learned to trust you. They learn that daddy's not going to drop me. Daddy's not going to let me go. Daddy loves me. He's going to protect me. I can trust my daddy. Amen? We come to the place with God. Lord, I'm, I, it starts off with faith and salvation. Lord, if I can trust you with eternity, why can't I trust you with my everyday life? Lord, if I can trust you with, with my salvation, why can't I trust you that you're going to give me the confidence to stand up and give a public profession of my faith? Why? If I, you know, I'm going to give a public profession. I'm going to follow you in believers' baptism. I'm going to take that next step. I'm going to go and share my faith. What you've done with what you've done for me. And sooner or later, great strides are doing, being done. Not because we have faith in God, but because we have believed. Because we believe God. There's a big difference in having faith in God and believing God. I can't. Yeah, that's that's the truth. If you would have told me some of the stuff that's going on with our church, and if you told me that was going to happen four months ago, I would have said, Yeah, right. It's not going to happen. But God brought us here on baby steps. Go here on baby steps. First, it was, hey, go so winning out in Uniontown. Go so winning in Green. Go so winning in Akron. Go outside of Hartville. God's got, you know, go, God's got more for us. And then we started those baby steps. We started looking at those baby steps. God, if we never followed God with the baby steps, God would not giving us where we're at now. He just wanted. God gives us things to grow. And as we grow our faith, and as God grows our faith, and we continue to believe Him, God gives us more and more in greater things. But if we don't use what we have, we won't get there. Go to um, chapter 12, 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. That may not be what I'm looking for. Uh, wrong verse. I don't know where I was going with this one. All right, forget that one. I don't want that verse is in there. Go to 2 Timothy chapter 2. It's a good verse. Just not sure what it's got to do with Christ being China. 2 Timothy chapter number 2. I seriously don't know what I was going with Romans chapter with 
1 Corinthians chapter 12. I don't know. If someone's going to go back on my thoughts and figure that out, let me know. 2 Timothy chapter number 2 and verse number 20. But in the great house there are not only vessels of gold and of silver, but of, um, also of wood and of earth, and some of honor and some to dishonor. If a man therefore purge himself from these, he shall be a vessel unto honor, sanctified and meet for the master's use, and prepared unto every good work. If we know of what God's nature is, and we understand, we exercise our understanding of God's nature, and we use and we yield ourselves as God's vessels for use, that brings joy. I mean, we went so winning today. We knew it was going to have some nasty. Wit. We knew it was going to be nasty. Wasn't the gold greatest out thing out there? But we went door knocking today. It doesn't make us any better Christians, any more righteous than the next guy down the street. But it makes us realize, hey, we have not only do we have faith that God can save someone, but we believed it and we put it to practice. And there is joy. Even if we didn't see anybody saved, it was great joy. There was happiness watching watching Tim and Ed get chased around by a dog. That was happiness. That was kind of funny for a little bit. You know, walking in the snow and getting pelted with snow. That wasn't so much, but it was I kinda of actually enjoyed it a little bit. But um, you know, happiness and joy are, are not the same things, but serving God brings joy. Amen. It brings joy. The Bible says, Come before his presence thing. We're supposed to enter his gates with thanksgiving and enter his courts with praise. Those are sim those are, are indications of joy. When we come into his gates with thanksgiving, into his courts with praise, and we serve the Lord with gladness and we're and we're praising the Lord for what he does. There's joy in the midst of tribulation. Well, you've got to exercise your understanding of God. Do we believe God's good? Amen. I believe God's good, but if I don't exercise myself knowing that God is good, do we believe that God is holy? Amen. Sure we do, but if I don't exercise myself knowing that God is holy, how does it benefit? How does that bring anything? I need to, I need to know that if God's holy, I need to be holy. That's what we'll find in 1 Peter. I'm supposed to be holy even as God is holy. Hey, does God? Do I believe that God? You know that God answers prayer. Absolutely, the Bible says that God's nature is that He, His very nature is that He hears and answers prayer. Do you believe that that God answers prayer? Yeah. Sure, we do. We have faith that God answers prayer, but do we believe it? Yeah. Do we put it to practice? Do we go to the next step and say, Hey, do we believe that God blesses those who give? You know, give all themselves or gives financially to the church. The Bible says, "Prove me." When we come to understand that no one has ever failed God, when we give, when we give to God, no one has ever failed. God has never failed them. He'll, he never forsake. He's never seen his righteous forsaken, nor a seed begging bread. We know that God's going to take care of us. If He takes care of the, the lilies of the field and the fowls of the air, do you not think God's going to help us out in the last ninety percent of our money? Sure, He will. If we, you know, we, when we stop and realize that we understand God's nature, it causes us to exercise our faith in the nature of God. Let me give you another one. Paul and Silas's actions of resting on God's nature led them to singing praise and prayer. Go back to Acts chapter number 16. Go back to Acts chapter number 16. Now I don't know what time Paul and Silas got, got arrested. I, I don't I don't see I don't see a passage saying what hour they are arrested. But look what it says in verse number verse number um, verse number 23. And when they had laid many stripes upon them, they cast them into prison, charging the jailer to keep them safely. It says, Who, having received such a charge, thrust them into the inner prison and made, the, and made their feet fast in the stocks. And then read the next three words of 25, And at midnight. Now, in this text, it doesn't say that they were immediately put into prison and it was like around midnight hour. I don't know when they got put into prison. I don't know, but I realize that some time had passed. Without doing any damage to my Bible, I can look at this and say, some time had passed. Do you believe that? That some time had passed, the time they got there, here they are on the way to the temple to pray, and they're, they're trying to serve God, this nagging demon-possessed woman behind them, and just running his mouth and telling him, hey, these preachers are doing this and this and the other, and, and what she was saying was true, but she just wanted to shut up. And they looked at her and says, I adjure the name of the son, Jesus, Son of God, come out of me, and they came out of her the same hour. And then because they did something and they got upset because now these people had their, their religious gain was gone. They got upset. They got frustrated. They brought them to the magistrates. They heaped up all sorts of lies. And all Peter, all Paul and Silas were doing was going to the temple to pray. <laughs> that would put me in a pretty sour disposition. And I got to thinking, I'm thinking this as I'm reading this. I'm thinking, what happens if that dog went ahead and bit Tim out door knocking? Here's, here's Tim out trying to door knock. And where's Ed? Get bit. He want to bite Ed. He want old piece of meat. He wants a new piece of meat. But here's, you know, here's here's Ed. 
You know, here's Pim out there door knocking the dog, leaves the dog boy, and he hits a big old hunk of his leg. Arrgh! Gets a whole big leg. Boy, he can sit back and say, man, I scraped my leg today, getting ready for church. Man, things aren't just going my way. Why am I serving God? What am I doing? I'm fixing to go to the temple. I'm fixing to go to church to pray. And here God's reading. I'm here to preaching. And boy, things aren't going my way. I'm out here going to door knocking, and a dog bites my leg. Oh, man. When some time had passed, Paul and Silas are in no sing sing. They're in pity party pit. They're in the middle of this prison, and they're sitting there fast bound in chains in the innermost prison. And some time had passed, but enough time had passed where they started singing and pra- singing and praising God and praying. <laughs> that's pretty. That's a difference. You know what I'm saying? We can all have bad days. Isn't that good to know we can all have bad days? But you know, whoever thought the idea that Christians don't have weak moments or bad days obviously never read the Bible. Read Psalms. <laughs> Man, David complained all the time to God. Just complaining. And God's just a man after God's own heart. Man, just complain. Just stop whining. My daughter's seven. And boy, she gets to talking, she gets to fussing. And it's a stop already. I just can't stand it. Crystal, she's all yours. I can't just like, handle your daughter, you know. But sometimes we get all frustrated with that. But here's Paul and Thomas. They're falsely accused. They're falsely imprisoned. They're falsely beaten. And yet they found time to praise God through prayer and song, even while they're in the midst of no sing sing. When nothing around was saying, hey, you should praise God. Man, think about all that we've been through as a church. Think about all you've been through in your life and what God is doing in your life right now. And think about how awesome God is working in your life. In the midst of all the tribulation, and yes, you're trusting him, you're believing in him. But you're doing more than just trusting and believing in him. What are you, you're, you're exercising your faith in him. And now you're resting on God's nature. There's a time where you can exercise, you can understand God's nature, you can exercise your faith in God into believing, and you can have a time where you're actually resting on God's nature. And we read that verse all the time, be still and know that I am God. Just be still. Don't do anything. Just wait. Just wait. Wait for what? We've got to do something. Just wait. Just wait. Just be still. Wait. Don't do anything drastic. Just wait. Be still. Why? Is God not in control? No. Sometime between the, between the time they got put fast in the prison, they don't know what time of the day it was. They just locked up in the prison. There's no sentencing. Rats are running by their feet. They're in there listening to all kinds of nasty smells in the prison. All, I don't know. Maybe they had cable to you. I don't know. But they're in there for long, long enough time, and, they're, and then they finally get to a place where they could sing and praise. And, and they could sing and pray. And God. And, uh, God heard their prayer and God moved. And God moved. Do you think that they're praying and asking God to send an earthquake to take off, the, to knock the chains loose? And to, no, they're just saying, Lord, I don't know what you're going to do, but Lord, you're good. You're just. You're holy. Whatever you do, God, you're righteous altogether. You're good. Whatever you do, Lord, we're your servants. We're yielding, we're yielded vessels, Lord. Whatever you want, we'll do. That's pretty awesome. We, we have to go sometimes have to go through some tribulation. To understand that and just keep on trusting God. Let me give you some thoughts. Revelation chapter 21. And I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth were passed away, and there was no more sea. And I, John, saw the holy city, a new, uh, new Jerusalem, coming down from heaven, out of, um, coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and He will dwell with them, and they will be His people, and God Himself shall be with them, and He and be their God. And God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes. And there shall be no more death, neither sorrow, nor crying, neither shall there be any more pain, for the former things are passed away. Mm-hmm. Joy overcomes sorrow, because tears will be forever wiped away. But joy overcomes sorrow. Why? Because we know in the end, God's going to God's gonna get the victories, God's going to be victorious, and it's what we've done for the Lord, and what we've been through is not for naught. It's, it's all for naught, because it's, all, it's not all for naught, because God's going to come out victorious in the end, 
and we're going to be with him, ruling and reigning, and God's going to wipe all tears away from our eyes. Joy overcomes sorrow. Joy overcomes tribulation because Christ has overcome the world. Go to John chapter 16. John chapter 16. Joy overcomes tribulation. No matter what we're going through, no matter what the world throws at us, joy overcomes tribulation. Verse 33. These things have I spoken unto you that in, my, that in me you might have peace. In the world you shall have tribulation. But be of good cheer, I have overcome the world. Joy overcomes tribulation. No matter what you're going through, God will bring you through it. You can have joy in that. Joy overcomes temptation. Go to 1 John chapter 4. 1 John chapter 4, verse number 4. Ye are of God, little children, and have overcome them. Because greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. Ye have overcome them. It's past tense. We already have victory over temptation because Christ is in us and he strengthens us. Go to Philippians chapter 4, verse number 13. Joy overcomes temptation because Christ is in us and through us. Over there in Philippians chapter number 4 and verse number 13, everybody likes to quote this verse, but it says this, I can do all things through Christ, which strengthens me. Christ, the fact that we're in Christ strengthens us. Amen. The fact that I am in him and he is in me, and that strengthens me. Knowing that I am not in this alone, that I have not God is not some far off being that created the world and left it to run on its own, that he's not in, involved in the hearts and affairs of men, but he's in my life and he's directing my steps and nothing I'm going through is not is, is is something everything that I'm going through is not something that's taken by God by surprise, but He's allowed in my life and it brings joy. One more. Joy is demonstrated through praise. Joy is demonstrated through prayer. Joy is demonstrating through Thanksgiving. This week is Thanksgiving week. It's not about the turkey. It's not about the ham. Yeah. It's not about the ham. It's not about the potatoes. It's not about the green beans. It's not about the gravy. It's not about the stuffing. It's not about the pumpkin pie, the pumpkin rolls. It's not about the cherry pies or the mince meat pies or the apple pies. It's not about the uh, noodles and gravy or the white, you know, maybe white beans or whatever you like to eat them. Or it's not about it. It's not about the fudge. Can I say that? It's not about the fudge. It's all about just giving God thanks, and we can rejoice in what God has done, what He is doing, but most importantly, what He will do. We can rejoice in what he will do. We serve a God who's victorious, and he's already victorious. Read the back of the book, and we know he's already victorious. Amen. Nothing right. that this world can do can alter God's victory. And we, we're on the winning side. We can thank right. God for what he's done, what he's doing, and what he'll continue to do in, 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 in this world, and we just get to be part of it. We, there's joy in witnessing. There's joy in telling people about Jesus. There's joy in getting chased out by a dove. There's joy in getting cussed out by a sailor. There's joy in getting in getting uh, you know the garage door shut on us. There's all kinds of joy, <laughs> especially when Tara rings the door, rings the garage bell. But um, there's rely you know, re joy is reliance on God. It's reliance on the Lord. It's helping those people that need help. If we look at the world today, man. There's the people around us today that need help. They they need their need. It's not financially. It's not food. They need something more than food. Yeah, you get someone, you give someone a turkey dinner, good. You fed them for a day. But what, what, is, what about their soul? What about their eternal state? What about their soul? Well, you know, helping those people in need, helping them, teaching those things, the ways of God, showing them, preaching the things. Man, I have so much joy serving Jesus. I love being a pastor. I love preaching. Why? Because I get to get stand up. Everybody looks at me. No, I can't stand people looking at me. Close your eyes. I can't stand that. What I really like is the fact that I can see people helped through the Word of God. That I can see people growing by the Word of God. That they take hold of the truths of God. And they take faith. They have the faith of God. And they start putting it into action. And as they put it into action, they say, man, God is who he said he was. And he's doing what he said he'll do. Oh, thank you, God, that you're true and every man's a liar. Amen? We can have joy in this world. Those Paul and Silas, they're locked up in prison. But you know what? In the end, they knew what was going to happen. And in the end, the jailer got saved. 
The jailer got saved. And you know what? Think about this. We have an entire book of the Bible. Philippians, my favorite book of the Bible. I love the book of Philippians. Four chapters of just jam-packed awesomeness. Four chapters of the Bible, and it's all because Paul and Silas were locked up in prison. And there's a group of believers in Philippi that wound up getting saved. And they're called, you know, Philippians, the book of the Philippians, they got saved because Paul and Silas got locked up in prison. Amen, man. I don't mind getting I don't mind getting put in prison as long as I get out. I don't mind going to prison for a couple hours. I don't want to go there for a couple days. I'm not I just I'm not, I'm interested in that, but if God bring, God brings you to it, praise the Lord. I'll do I'll do it for the Lord's sake. If it's I'm, if it's for if for the Lord's sake, if it's for my own sake, write me off. Don't visit me. All right? Send me a send me a send me a time bomb or something. Get, put me on my misery. But joy is demonstrated through those things and, and being a witness. There's so much joy in serving Jesus. Things that this world can't take away. There's so much joy in serving Jesus. And you find the Christian who's sitting back there, sour, lemon, lemon face, don't have any joy of the Lord. God's not answering their prayer. They sit back, arms crossed, folded. I can't figure out why God's not blessing them. And they can't figure out why whether they're mo- woes and knees. You've got to ask them, what was the last time you just believed God? What was the last you got trust in God? Well, I know I'm saved. Okay. What was the last time you followed the Lord in doing something? What was the last time you got off your blessed assurance and got unction in your bunction and served God? What was the last time you got fired up for the things of God? What was the last time you went door knocking? What was the last time you tithed? What was the last time you read your Bible? What was the last time you prayed? What was the last time you fasted? What was the last time you just gave God glory for what he's doing in your life? Amen. You can't you cannot sit back in a in a pity party pit and a in a in a seat of misery and scorn. And stay there forever if you're praising God. You just can't. Sooner or later, it's going to come like Job said. I know in my flesh, that my, you know, the worms going to destroy this body. I know in my flesh, I'll see God. Amen. Though he slay me, Praise yet will I trust him. I don't know what God's doing in my life, but I'm just going to give God glory because he's doing something. Amen. Man, we can rejoice in that. For three and a half years, I'm in Florida. Three and a half years or something, for, for whatever I was in Florida. Man, God was putting me through a ringer, and I was mumbling, complaining. He said, I don't know what I was going to do. And I just got to a place that said, Lord, I want to get to a place where I can just serve you, where I can just love you, where I can just be grateful and, and show praise regardless where I'm at. And God says, start now. No, no, no. God, you got to get me a different situation. Paul said, I learned that whatever state I am, literally state, whatever position, wherever I'm at, therewith I'm content. Just thank God for what he does through us. Just rejoice in the Lord. And again, I say rejoice. Just rejoice in what God does for us. Have joy again. Rejoice. Go back. If you lost your joy for the Lord, go back to where it was you lost it. David realized where it was. There was sin in his heart. Pastor, I don't have any joy in my heart. i got nothing to live for. Really? What sin do you have in your life that's unconfessed? What sin in your life you're not you're not getting? What sin? Is, what sin in your life are you trying to harbor from God? What sin? What sin is it in your life you're trying to? Well, I, well, what what right do you have to judge? First thing I always say to me, well, I've got every right to judge you. You came to me asking me, and I'm telling you, your problem is you got sin in your life. Come on, fix yourself. <laughs> Praise the Lord. There's joy, man. There's joy in serving Jesus. Go back to where you were. Um, David said, "Restore unto me the joy of my salvation." Well, where do you lose the joy? It's when he, it's when he fornicated around with Bathsheba, had a, went into an adulter, an adulterous relationship with Bathsheba, got her pregnant, had Uriah come back from the battlefield, tried covering up his sins. If you cover up your sins, you shall not prosper. Amen. It will not prosper. Be sure your sin will find you out. He wouldn't go into his wife, so David sent him to the front line of battle and had him pretty much killed. And then he goes in, and, and then he goes in, and God says, no, 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 no. You think it was hidden, but I saw it all. And he says, punishment's going to come, and God's going to punish you. And aren't you glad that God punishes his children? Amen. I'm thankful God punishes yeah. me. God takes me to the woodshed all the time. Sometimes it's not a very long trip. Sometimes he didn't wait for the woodshed. He goes, boom, and boy, he gets a hold of my heart and zaps me really good. And he'll chastise me. It's not always with, not always with a spanking. Sometimes it's with that, that word from the word of the Lord. He corrects me. I'm thankful for the chastising of God. It Amen. means I know who my father is. Amen. I know who my daddy is. But you look at this passage. You look at what's going on. Man, so many people, they, they don't even realize their, where their, their sin issue is. Joy is demonstrated through praise. It's demonstrated through prayer. It's demonstrated through witnessing. 
It's demonstrated through that reliance on God. I can't even walk without you holding my hand. Lord, I can't even do anything without you. But with you in me, I can do anything. The Bible says I can do all things through Christ, which strengthens me. It isn't that Christ strengthens me. The fact that I can do all things through Christ, that strengthens me. That strengthens me. Man, what is it in our life today? We have a week of thanksgiving. Some of us are traveling. Some are just staying back. We have a week of just gratitude attitude. You can't teach gratitude. That's the truth. And you can tell the people who don't have gratitude because they're forced to give God thanks. One day, it was, oh, what are you thankful for? I remember, I remember Thanksgiving time at our house. We'd always have the time. And why I tell you what, Thanksgiving was the was the premier holiday at our, you know, one of the premier holidays of our of our of our uh, of our house. We had we kind of come to the dinner table unless we're dressed to the teeth. I mean, if we didn't come to, you know, come with a pressed you know, iron shirt and comb our hair and, and, you know, wash our hands really good and, and put on a tie and a suit jacket, which is stupid because I got to the table and I take my suit jacket off. How stupid. Anyways, and they go around, okay, but moment for a restart, we have to name three things we're thankful for. Turkey, ham, mashed potatoes. <laughs> no, no, no. Cranberry sauce. No one was thankful. <laughs> but it's like we got to be thankful for something. What are you thankful for? And it's like you can go. Oh, I don't know. What am I thinking? You can't teach gratitude. I can't teach my daughter gratitude. I can teach her to say thank you, but I can't teach her gratitude. And I can teach her lip service. I can teach her to lie and say thank you when she's not really thankful. But you know, grat gratitude comes, and the Bible talks about that in Second Timothy about the heart of gratitude. We're living in a perilous times when men are ungrateful. The human heart is ungrateful. And if we can't thank God, we're ungrateful. If we can't thank God, we have no joy in our heart. Something's wrong with the joy. Find a Christian who's always walking around with a lower lip, never finding themselves in victory. You've got to ask themselves, are they even saved? The joy of the Lord is my strength. He gives me joy. It's a fruit of the Spirit. Find a Christian who has no joy. They're probably not a Christian. They're professing. they got sin in their life. They're not right. They're not right. David knew where his joy was. He went back and found it when he when he got his heart right with God. Man, this week we have Thanksgiving. We have so much to be thankful for. We have so much to be grateful for. Let's give thanks out of a joyful heart. Man, Lord, look at all you've done for us. And it says God's nature to be good. It's God's nature that we can rest on. When we understand God's nature and we're exercising our faith in God's nature and we believe God, not just have faith, but actually believe God and do what he says to do. And we and we and we go out and we and we rest on his promises, we rest on his nature. Oh, it brings joy, doesn't it? Doesn't it bring joy? Amen. Man, I've got joy down in my heart. I'll close with this. I think I said that once. I'll close with this. There's a shopping a lady at a shopping cart, and she's going down the aisle and she's got four containers or four things of, of dish detergent. She says, I've got joy, 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 joy down in my cart. You know, we gotta have joy in our hearts. You know, we gotta have joy that the world can't take away. We gotta have joy in our hearts. Let's pray. Father, we thank you.